Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. In the multiverse out there. Um, so, my name is Paula Von Tempe. I'm the Dean at the Graduate School of Oceanography and I guess the overall steward of the Narragansett Bay Campus and I want to welcome everybody to tonight's lecture. We're really pleased that you could all be here. Um, you know, this is um, an opportunity for us to really say two things. First of all, welcome to the Narragansett Bay Campus and on behalf of GSO. And then the other thing is, thank you everybody for voting yes on one. <laughs> um, hopefully you all did, but if you didn't, don't tell me. Um, no, but I, I wanted to say, you know, this is a really important investment by the taxpayers of Rhode Island in the state of Rhode Island's education and research, okay? Um, we are thrilled to be able to make some improvements on the Bay Campus. Hopefully some of you saw um, some of the improvements in phase one, which you voted on favorably in 2018. Our new pier is nearly complete and we'll welcome the new ship Narragansett Dawn, which will arrive in 2024. Um, we've got, uh, we're about to break ground on the Ocean Robotics Laboratory, which will be a brand new building next to our newest building, the OSEC building up on the hill, which you can see on your way out. Um, the Ocean Robotics Laboratory will house ocean engineers and oceanographers, as well as a giant test tank for us to fabricate new sensors, new platforms, and new robots that we can use to sample the ocean and observe different ocean properties in a number of different ways. We actually can test it in the building, take it into the bay and test it before we take it out into the ocean and actually use it officially. So it's a really exciting hub of innovation, technology development, and will facilitate tremendous research. And quite frankly, I expect there'll be a long line of graduate students and undergraduate students that want to work in that building. Uh, I think one of the um, last things I just want to say is I strongly encourage you to ask our speakers questions. They are both brilliant experts in their field. I think GSO and the Bay Campus are incredibly lucky to have them, as is URI. And I just also want to say that our next event is currently scheduled for February 7th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. with a focus on storytelling called How Oceans Speak Through the People. This will feature Alex DeCicio, Kendall Moore, Amelia Moore, and Melba Trevino-Pena. So with that, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers this evening. First, we have J.P. Walsh. He's the director of the Coastal Resources Center, or CRC, and a professor of oceanography at GSO. He's a geological oceanographer with over 25 years of experience in coastal and ocean research, and has worked in the muddy mangroves of Papua New Guinea, to the icy waters of Antarctica. He arrived at URI in 2018 and since has been working locally and globally with CRC and other colleagues. He holds a, a doctorate in oceanography from the University of Washington, a Master of Science in Marine Science from Stony Brook, and a bachelor's degree in geology from Colgate. So welcome, JP. Thank you for doing this. Next, oh, sorry. <laughs> Take a bow one. Next is Reiner Lohmann. I'm really pleased to have Reiner here as well. He's a professor of oceanography at GSO and the director of the University of Rhode Island Superfund Research Center, which focuses on sources, transport, exposure, and effects of PFAS, which is an acronym called STEEP. And if you don't know what PFAS are, they're those forever chemicals that are pretty much in everything these days. His group conducts research into the sources, transport, and bioaccumulation of anthropogenic pollutants, often relying on the use of passive samplers. Other than PFAS, his research covers dioxins, PCBs, and legacy pesticides and emerging contaminants. He received his PhD in environmental science from Lancaster University in the UK. So, Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, speakers, for doing this. And I turn it over to J.P. Walsh. A mouse? <laughs> Where is there it is? Man, someone's got good vision. I can't. Okay, there we go. So 
if I start talking, I literally just came from class on main campus, so if I start talking about the syllabus and homework assignments, you know, just correct me. Um, so I'm going to be talking about ocean plastic, and I think we all know it's, it's a big problem. I thought I'd start with this picture that I took a few years ago uh, here on the Bay Campus, and you can see the Endeavor uh, in the background and in the foreground uh, a piece of plastic. And this is just a really common theme now. Um, you know, I'm sure you all visit the beach on a regular basis, and, and it's really hard to escape uh, this scenario. Um, I thought I'd start just giving a little bit of background on myself, uh, just to orient you. I'm, I'm originally from New Jersey, and in the lower left is a picture of me as a young kid cleaning up after a hurricane, actually. And I remember being super excited about hurricanes and their impact, and, uh, and I really think that's carried over. A lot of what I do uh, relates to those events. Um, you heard about the rest of my background, academic uh, career. Um, I have this picture here from uh, when I was doing my PhD work in Papua New Guinea in those mangroves. Uh, you know, I looked a little bit different, um, <laughs> so uh, times have changed a little. And on the far right is a photo from the summer with some of uh, my graduate students and a, a close colleague. Um, you know, I, I think uh, what's really important that I need to emphasize in this, the beginning of this talk is, is I need to thank a lot of people, in particular uh, my PhD student, Victoria Fulfer, um, who's currently doing a Fulbright in Vietnam. Um, also, many students and collaborators that have worked on this research. Uh, of course, colleagues across CRC, GSO, URI. Uh, the URI Plastic uh, Land to Sea Initiative is, is an ongoing effort to really focus on all different aspects of the plastic problem. I'm looking at the sort of the ocean end of the system. There's, uh, of course, a lot of great researchers looking at uh, what you know, what the plastics are, and, and solutions on that, end, on the other side of the coin, um, and also I, I should mention that the first funding that I have that is funded this work actually came from the URI fraternities and sororities. Uh, they raised thirty-five thousand dollars to invest in this initial work, and I really appreciate that support to get this work off the ground. Uh, so shown here is a picture of. Um, of a figure from an NSF program that I did a number of years ago. And it's, it's showing uh, a concept known as source to sink. Uh, a lot of my research focused on how a material from land moves into the sea, and in particular, sediments are eroded from mountains. They move, they can be stored in different areas. Uh, and there are a number of processes that move along uh, the, the uh, land and sea system. I'm not going to be talking about all this, but of course, all of this background is really relevant to the work that I'm doing now on plastics um, and also um, other pollution, uh, and, and so that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, also, as I mentioned, I'm doing a lot of work on coastal processes, and there is a lot of coupling between the coast and these problems. Uh, just this weekend, I was out uh, walking the beach uh, with my dog, and all of the nor'easters that we've had recently have just brought a tremendous amount of plastics on, along our coastline, much more than I've seen in the past. So I think this is uh, one of the things we need to keep in mind is, is the coupling of processes and the problem. Um, I thought I'd start with this picture. Of course, I'm going to talk today about plastics. And uh, uh, some of you may rem remember the graduate. Uh, and shown here is the picture of, of the adult uh, giving the young Dustin Hoffman some advice about a future career direction. You know, one word, plastics, uh, and, and there was a lot of truth to that. Of course, it was an interesting story that that was being told in, but um, I wanted to provide that context and put that in perspective. Here's a graph of global plastic production uh, from 1950 to present. Uh, you can see that red line, and, and notice I indicate right here, the graduate excuse me, was released in 1967, uh, and uh, you can see our plastic production has really uh, continued to increase um, really uh, incredibly. So it's, it's quite concerning in my mind, and I'm sure uh, you all uh, are aware of this bigger issue. Um, on the far left, I have a uh, little piece of a clip from um, the New York Times in 1909, which was uh, announcing this new substance called Bakelite, which um, uh, you know, they were excited about the new properties of. And that's what a lot of the plastic story is. Plastic is really useful. That's why it's found in so many things. Uh, I'm not here to, 
to say I don't use plastic, right? It's part of our society and it pr produces a lot. Um, but we need to think about the ramifications, of course. Uh, and shown at the bottom here is the name of that first compound. Um, oxy, benzy, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. Maybe Reiner can later in the talk. Uh, how could we not be scared about this being produced and now um, propagating um, into our environment? So something to, to keep in mind as we talk about this topic. Uh, so shown here is an image of uh, illustrating sort of the plastic problem. We produce a lot of plastic, right? Uh, shown on the far right, or excuse me, uh, your left, my right. Um, hundreds of millions of tons of plastic per year. Um, uh, as you go further in the orange, you can see uh, the, a lot of that is produced in the coastal zone. And of course, um, one of the reasons for that is today we have, you know, on the order of 2 billion people living within 30 miles of the coast. It's a huge population with a lot of demand. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, there's, a, there's mismanagement, um, both in, in places where maybe the infrastructure is not in place, but also just through the sheer volume of, of you know, trash cans and things being moved. Um, we're losing a lot to the environment. It's estimated on the order of 8 million tons per year, but there's, you know, there's pretty wide error bars on that. Of course, um, you know, we've heard about plastic in the ocean, and I'll talk uh, quite a bit there. Um, but uh, it's a big issue um, rooted in a really big problem of, of plastics production. Uh, shown here is another map uh, from uh, a major scientific publication. Uh, what this is, is uh, you'll notice the dots there are plastic inputs from rivers, the blue dots. and. Um, this is sort of modeled based upon where plastics are being produced, the nature of these river systems, and how plastics being managed. Uh, and what you'll notice, I think what's striking to, to me, is the, the sheer number of dots and the size of them in Asia. Uh, the reality is about 2 thirds um, of the estimated input here is in the Asian region, um, which is really concerning, of course. Um, what I also should mention here is when we look at this figure, you look at the United States and the New England and you see some, some little dots and you might think, huh, well, we only have little dots. Maybe there's not a problem. Um, and uh, well, well, we'll talk about that more here in the, the presentation. So um, what happens to plastic when it goes into the marine environment? Well, there's a lot of processes that are operating, uh, physical, chemical, biological, geological, um, of course, physically, plastic, when it gets into the marine environment, you have waves and water movement that can actually, the stresses can break down particles. Chemically, we have uh, UV radiation and other uh, processes in the marine system that can break down plastics as well. Uh, from those processes, we end up with this distribution of particles that can then, unfortunately, end up in different parts of the biological system. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Not only do we have big, part of, big plastic pieces uh, that large organisms can, can eat, we also have very small plastic pieces that small organisms can eat. So we can have this you know, great concern about um, different uh, entry points of that pollutant into the uh, biological system and then the ramifications of it. Um, and we'll, I'm sure, be hearing more on that um, from Reiner. Um, uh, shown here are some tough images, uh, and I know that you've all seen these, um, uh, but I, I'd be remiss to not include some of them. Um, birds decaying with their gut filled with plastic particles, uh, other organisms, you know, macro charismatic organisms wrapped in, in plastic. Uh, these are hard images. This has motivated a lot of concern and passion. Um, I can tell you that so I teach a, a, a 100 level URI class that just started today. Those students, you know, one of the topics that they are really concerned about is um, you know, really powerful images. But I think something that I want to emphasize here is that it goes beyond these big organisms, right? It's the whole ecosystem uh, and of course humans that may ultimately be impacted. We're still there's so much that we don't know about this experiment that we're running um, that I think uh, is concerning. 
So um, shown here is a map uh, of the world. And um, on that map, uh, this is a little bit uh, you know, from a number of years ago, 2014. But these are surface measurements of plastic concentrations from ships transiting ocean basins. And what you can see in the colors indicates sort of the concentrations of those measurements. And uh, you see sort of these pockets, um, or as has we've come to heard, we call them patches. The, um, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch off of our coast received a lot of attention. Um, over time, we've sort of recognized that there are patches throughout our oceans. Uh, we find them because of the physical oceanography that congregates that plastic um, in those systems known as gyres. So in all the uh, sort of northern hemisphere uh, areas and southern hemisphere in the central gyres, we um, basically accumulate these plastics, which is what's shown in the gray shading and sort of these concentrated zones. Um, so we do see these high concentrations in the oceans. Some estimates have been made of input and over time and how much uh, we see in the surface ocean. And it's been estimated that about 90%, 99% is unaccounted for. So there's been readjustment of that. I think the important point is a lot of plastic is unaccounted for. Um, and it's not um, in the floating in the surface ocean in those garbage patches. It's elsewhere. And that we still need to understand. Um, another point I want to make in this figure is um, again, when you look at the dots, you see the red dots in the central of the ocean basin, and you see the nice blue dots around, for example, where we live. And so you might take away from this figure, oh, well, the problem's you know, not where we are. Um, and that's, again, something I, I want to talk about today. So maybe to convince you that we have a problem, I'll show you a picture that I took. This is um, on the coastline of uh, just east of um, south of Providence, looking north towards the city. Um, and, you know, it t looks to me like there's an awful lot of plastic on the shoreline. Um, there's a little bit of marsh there. Granted, this is a very, you know, perhaps a unique location where we have a particular high accumulation, but this is a lot of plastic. And I think um, the more sites uh, during COVID, uh, Stuart and I kind of visited a number of sites around our coast, and it was, you know, you see it everywhere in all sorts of forms. Uh, and that's what I'll be talking more about. So, um, all right, we produce a lot of plastic on land. It gets to the coast in a variety of ways. What happens to it when it gets to the ocean? Well, it can move around in many ways. One is that plastic, it's not all the same. You know, many people think, oh, plastic floats. And some plastic does float, but not all, and I'll talk about that. So the density on the far left of the figure, you can see there's low dense plastic and high dense plastic. That's gonna determine how it moves in the water column. Um, the particles of plastic can move either along the surface, and of course you've all seen that from a plane or from you know, driving over by waterways. It can also move in the water column in, sus in a suspended fashion. It also can move um, along the seabed, uh, moved by currents uh, that are moving along the system. So uh, it's quite complicated in how just the basics of how it can move around in the coastal system. Um, as, as I already mentioned, the chemical and physical processes can break down these materials, fragment it. Uh, organi the organic material can biofoul, it can stick it together, things can aggregate, and it can affect the density. So even less dense particles can become more dense and then settle um, out of the system. Um, and of course, as we already talked about, it can be ingested by organisms and then um, leave their uh, bodies in fecal pellet form and end up on the seafloor. So um, a take home point is that there's a lot that moves uh, plastic around in the system and we're still learning about all those processes and frankly we've been learning about them for, for decades in how we just understand sediments in our coast. But an important point is that it all ends up in many cases or is going to end up on the seafloor or on the shoreline um, over time. And that's concerning because there, are, there is organisms that live on the seafloor as well. We have the infauna that are um, churning through that soil, and then organisms are eating those. So it's, it's a complicated system um, that we are still learning about. So uh, how do we learn about it? How do we know where plastic is in, in the ocean? 
I'm not going to talk about every type of study, but I'll talk about what we've done um, here in Narragansett Bay to understand this system. Um, so on the far left, um, what we've done is uh, different types of sampling. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize is that in understanding this problem, many people often look, you know, go out on a ship and sample the seafloor, or they work on land and sample the coast. I was really interested in what's happening across that system. How does it vary? So we had transects, multiple transects at a given location, and we would sample the what we call the subaerial, the above water parts of the beach, and then into the intertidal zone, and then go out into the subaqueous, go underwater, take a sample. And then we also went out on uh, sort of a small research vessel, uh, URI's Captain Burt, and went out and did some sampling um, nearby. Um, of course, we'd put our samples into glass jars so we wouldn't contaminate it. We'd be very careful there. We would take a big sample that we would sieve to look at what are called the macroplastics, the plastics that are bigger than five millimeters. And then we would use a, a process where um, we would essentially small plastics using a, eventually a de density separation and then filtration to get the suspected plastics onto a filter. And then those filters would then be analyzed by either by microscope, usually initially, and then using a couple different methods to try and identify it. It's a long process. It takes time. This is why the data in plastic in the ocean is really, you know, is slowly growing. Um, but, um, but we are making good progress. All right, so I've given you a lot of information. Now I'm going to give you some data. This is the exciting, this is like the fireworks part of the celebration of uh, this presentation. So on the far left is Narragansett Bay, beautiful estuarine system. At the head of the bay is sort of the urbanized area around Providence. Um, as you move down the system, we're currently, I don't have a pointer, but we're on that western shore getting closer to the mouth of the bay. Um, you know, we didn't have samples. We couldn't go everywhere. We didn't have a lot of time, but we did both shoreline and um, grab sampling of the seafloor. On the right, we have two graphs. Plastic concentration, particles per kilogram of dry sediment. On the right, this macro-micro ratio. So let me first talk about the left graph. That's probably the simplest. So um, what you can see is a plot of a bar graph for the sites on the left going down the bay. And I think it doesn't take a PhD scientist to look at that figure and see that in the blue and in the orange, we see a pattern of high values up near Bold Point, which is the site that I showed you that picture from originally. Very high values. Thousands of particles per kilogram of sediment. Um, huge concentrations. As you move further down the system, we see a progressively uh, sort of decreasing amount. Uh, we can model that, and I won't get into all that stuff. But really, it doesn't go to zero, right? Even down at Narragansett Bay, where we are, we're still looking at hundreds of particles per kilogram of sediment. That's a lot. Um, uh, shown on the right, um, another thing I should, before I pivot to the, to the right, um, is that you'll also see the shoreline and subaqueous. One of my, sort of our, our expectations was that you'd probably see a lot more on the shoreline because of the low density dominance of, of the particles. But you'll notice those bars, I mean, we don't have bars everywhere where we, you know, both, but generally they both show this sort of pattern going down the system. Um, on the right is a, um, a graph of the ratio of the mass of macro to the mass of microplastics. And if, if there was an equal amount of those, it would plot at one. Um, but you'll notice in the top of the figure, we have much more macro than microplastic, um, which is probably logical. That's where a lot of the input of big stuff is. And as we go down the system, we see um, a dominance of, of microplastic. Um, shown here is another graph that I'll just quickly highlight. Uh, this is um, or two graphs, similar. Left-hand side is microplastics. Uh, the right side is macroplastics. Uh, and these are both going from the city down the uh, estuarine system. You see a basic trend of high values at the, at, you know, up, at the up, upper part of the estuary and decreasing with depth, or excuse me, with distance from the city. Um, 
what I wanted to highlight here is that we have a couple colors. These in indicate different parts of the coastal system. And you'll notice there's not a clear pattern of one area. You know, it's not only in the upper beach that we see plastics. Um, it's not only on the seabed. It's kind of scattered. Generally, it's kind of maybe equal, especially as you look down the system, you see plastics um, in all environments across the system. All right, so enough of, you know, I'll show one more graph, I think, but that's some data just to highlight the, the problem. Um, another key point that I want to make is the, um, the incredible mix of particles. So shown on the left is a sieve of one jar of sample and the diversity of the shape and the color of plastics is, it's beautiful, but it's terrifying. This, this picture actually scares me more than anything because it just shows the complexity of the problem. Each of those you know, pieces represents essentially a different product and that's just in one sample in the environment. Uh, so again, that's one sample at one location at that one there I showed you the picture. On the right is um, all of our samples. We, we probably analyzed, uh, Victoria analyzed over 1,000 samples um, to look at the plastic um, polymers. Uh, you'll see the dominance of polypropylene, polystyrene, and uh, polyethylene. These are sort of the single-use plastics make up on the order of you know, over 90% of the plastics that we're seeing. Um, of course, those same polymers can be found in not single-use things, but I think the reality is it's, you know, the single-use products are really um, a challenge. Um, uh, another graph that I just was going to quickly show you is on the left-hand side is looking at the particle type um, and with distance down the uh, system. Um, there's been a lot of attention on fibers, right, because our clothing, uh, a lot of it's synthetic. That's breaking down and ending up into the, the ocean system. Um, and we do see a lot of fibers. So again, 100% is all the particle types. Um, what you see here um, for the types of particles, first let's start at the top. The red is what we call nurdles. Those are the little balls that go into plastic production. We actually only saw in one sample uh, a, like a few nurdles. Um, but then uh, moving down the system, you see uh, you know, about mostly fragments and fibers. Maybe you could argue as you move down the system, we see an increase in fibers because maybe those particles are being trapped in the estuary. But that's just some additional data that needs um, maybe some more insight. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight, go back to that point about the density. Uh, shown here is a graph that shows density on the y-axis and then different types of plastics to indicate whether they would float or sink in seawater. Um, I won't go through all those plastics, but I wanted to show you one figure that um, is where we look at the density of the plastics that we captured in our data. Um, so on the x-axis is particle density, and on the y-axis different habitats. And first of all, what you'll notice is that a lot, not surprisingly, a lot of the low dense plastics are ending up sort of in the beach dune. That makes a lot of sense, right? The low dense, they're gonna float and they'll end up on the beach, right? Um, but I also wanna highlight not all the low dense plastic does. Notice we are also seeing the low dense plastic on, uh, in the intertidal zone and in the subaqueous environment, which means they are being biofouled and, and ending up on the sort of underwater. Um, of course, the higher dense plastics generally we do see in the intertidal zone in the subaqueous part of the system. All right, so um, I think the reality is, is pl coastal plastics are a huge problem. Here are some pictures from other places around the world. I hope you'll agree that Rhode Island is an issue. As we look uh, internationally um, where the production is, is high, it's, it's a great concern. Um, and I worry most is that in many places we're kind of getting used to this problem. You can see people just sort of living with the reality. Um, I do think we need to sort of rethink our actions, reuse when possible, refuse when able, reduce what, you, what we use, repair when we can, and recycle as much as possible. Um, we also need to encourage the private sector to be thinking about the life cycle of everything we make um, so that not only is it useful during the limited time it may be used, but that it has a, a sustainable future. 
So we have a big problem with plastics. Um, we do need uh, more research, uh, and I think we're doing some great stuff here at GSO, URI, and, and really around the world. Um, we also need to put that science into action. Uh, the Coastal Resources Center, where I work, Sea Grant, um, and many other entities, uh, we got to champion the change, and, um, and, I, and I hope that you'll all be part of that. So thank you. Oh, and went a little long. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Are you a Mac user? No, I'm not. I think you hit the red dot. Actually, we have questions for the end. great. Well, I wish you could always give the talk for me. All right, welcome again. My name is Rainer Luhmann. I'll do the second part. I'll talk about the, the chemicals you can't see, can't smell, can't taste. So, and talk about PFASs, and they're known because they include a lot of fluorine. But I was supposed to also share some Im images of how I got here, but I chose a slightly different way of showing how I got here. Um, so on the top is the University of Bochum in Germany, where I got my first two years of my undergraduate degree. I went then to the top right, which is Strasbourg, which is French, but is very Germanic in his history because the German and French always fought about it. And so now I was welcomed with open arms for a change. That's where I got my degree in chemical engineering. I then went to Lancaster in the UK where I got my PhD and I never realized how beautiful it can look. But I guess I was always inside the town, not outside. Um, I did a couple of postdocs, one in Cambridge at MIT and then in Bremen and then eventually I ended up at this beautiful location. All right, so with that introduction, fluorine. Um, yeah, if you think about fluorine, you might go back to high school or undergraduate degrees. You might think of this, some gas, greenish, nasty. That's a good description. If you add it into water, you get hydrofluoric acid. Now, that's really powerful stuff. I mean, it dissolves rocks. And we had a lab that did this here, but it's very scary because if you miss and you hit your skin, then you're in the emergency room next. So we don't really want to work with HF. But there's more to fluorine, and I guess that's what I talk about. So those two molecules on the right became very famous, and you don't have to memorize them right now. I'll have a quiz later. But you probably heard of Teflon, and we wouldn't have Teflon without fluorine. And you might have heard of, heard of aqueous film forming foams, very powerful foams that have been made to extinguish fuel fires very, very quickly. And for a long time, till a year ago, the Department of Defense mandated that any, uh, every ship needed to have fluorine containing foam as part of the equipment they needed to extinguish fuel in a really short amount of time. That requirement has been changed last year and now it's, as of next year, every foam that the Department of Defense will buy will not have fluorine anymore except for fluorine, uh, sorry, except for foam used in submarines. And you can might imagine why they want to have a safe submarine. All right, so, Teflon, great milestone. It's almost as famous as plastics. It is also plastic, but it's a special one. And it was accidentally found when scientists were working in the Manhattan Project and they needed something to help seal the centrifuges as they were enriching uh, plutonium. So they used Teflon at that point, but of course it's a very limited use. So other uses were found. So I believe it was used on space, space suits I think they had some special bags for the rocks that they also contain Teflon. But again, that's a pretty small segment to sell astronauts. <laughs> so <laughs> chemical industry is very creative in selling products. So we came up with this one. Probably you all might have had in your lifetime a Teflon frying pan at home. Wonderful thing. Eggs don't stick anymore. As long as you don't scratch it, at which stage often we throw it away and you buy the new next one. Accidentally, if you really heat this too high, the gases that come out um, can kill birds. But that's a different story. All right, so let's talk chemistry. Because he was a geologist, so he doesn't have to pronounce those names. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. So this molecule is so famous. I'm sure you, have you seen it before? Yes? All right, all right. So 
In case you haven't seen it, you can actually watch it. It has, it has been so famous that it has inspired two, actually more than two movies by now, but two movies. One is The Devil We Know, which is a documentary, and then if that is too dry, you can watch the Hollywood version, Dark Waters. They both tell a very similar story, um, and that's Mark Ruffalo. So they tell the story of uh, an attorney, Rob Bellot, who works for a company that basically works for industry to help navigate EPA rules, or maybe circumvent, I'm not sure. So he's a very corporate lawyer. And then one day he gets a call from a farmer that lives next to his grandmother in West Virginia. And this farmer happens to have a field that he leased, or he has several fields, he has cows. And one of his fields where he, um, close to the land he leased to DuPont for some a landfill, a dry landfill, so just stuff, the cows were dying. And he couldn't figure out why. So he thought, well, that's a smart guy, you know, my, my neighbor's grandson, who is a lawyer, maybe he can help me. And he worked with chemicals. And so eventually, for some bizarre reason, the lawyer actually agrees, to say, yeah, I'll take on your case because you thought, well, what else can I do with my grandmother? And so over the next 10 years, he works on this case. He finally realizes that the cows are dying because DuPont not only put solid stuff in the landfill, but also liquids, and they trickle into the through the streams into this, uh, f into the fields where the f cows are, and the cows basically drink the water and die eventually. So that's basically the story. He then is smart enough to figure out a way to um, get DuPont into court, and he wins the first settlement over, I think, 35 million. And then something unusual happens because he, he's not happy with the money, but he reinvests the money to, to launch what becomes the biggest epidemiological study we've ever had in the US for um, man made chemicals. So basically anybody within the town surrounding the West Virginia plants of DuPont is eligible to come, give blood, and share the medical history, and in return they get a few hundred dollars. And they time it such that it's just before Christmas. So everybody's happy to get some extra money, they give the blood, they fill out the questionnaires, they get the money, and so suddenly the lawyer has 60,000 people that have signed up for this health study. And the agreement he made with DuPont was if we find, through a panel of independent scientists, a probable link, so a, a causality between exposure to PFOA, that molecule, and the health outcomes in the community, you'll have to pay for it. And DuPont thought, ah, it's never going to happen. Well, it turns out in six cases, the science panel said, yes, there's a link. And so next then is basically big settlement. DuPont pays 800 million to the people of that of the town surrounding that uh, production facility, Parkersburg, West Virginia. And basically, the devil we know is a documentary, so there's a lot of the footage of the de uh, depositions, a lot of the documents that were unearthed, and this is a slightly dramatized version of the same story. So if you haven't seen it, take a look, and you'll feature that molecule up there, very famous. All right, so I was told I'm not allowed to have words on a slide. <laughs> So I thought, well, at least I have one. <coughs> but I agree, you know, you're not here to, to, to read. So let me cover this up. <laughs> so what I wanted to tell with all those words, let me try to tell it in pictures. We talked about Teflon. So Teflon is this great invention. To make Teflon, you need this PFOA, this molecule, to get it into suspension and get the chemistry going. <coughs> when this, the Teflon is then shipped out to the manufacturers who make frying pans or coat something else, they make the chemistry happen, it forms this nice coating, and then the PFOA is basically released through the stacks. And that's how we have a lot of problems with the Teflon chemistry I just talked about. But we also have PFAS as another product, like anything that is really uh, water repellent and stain repellent. So up to a few years ago, most outdoor jackets had some PFAS on them, so chemistry with fluorine. Almost all carpets that were sold up to a few years ago that were stain repellent had some coating that had PFASs on them. And that's the, the, the magic of this fluorine chemistry. Indeed, you see the water doesn't even, doesn't even spread out. It really it doesn't want to be on the surface. So the chemistry is unique. It's very powerful, but of course it wears off. Just like you scratched your Teflon frying pan over time, at this stage, even the best coated jacket will start losing its sparkle. It's fluorines, and then eventually you have to buy something new or recoated. And because of that, we're all exposed. 
and we have been for a while. Um, two actions were taken. 3M phased out their own fluorine chemistry, the worst, the PFOS, so the sister molecule in 2002, and switched to something different. And you might have just heard 3M just announced they're going to phase out completely by 2024. Um, eventually, once the Teflon story broke, DuPont and eight others that use PFOA agreed to phase it out by 2015. And again, they replaced it with something else. And so what we see when we look at trends in, in human serums, and you can see some of these graphs, after the phase out, it is not as if things just magically disappear, but we, we keep being exposed because there are so many products where this chemistry is used. And just like the plastics that JP talked about, once you make chemicals or products that are really, really persistent, that don't really break down easily, there's no way of escaping, right? It's not as if we have a magic train where things just disappear from Earth, but they have to stay in the system somewhere. So we make these products by industry. We make wonderful products, would have unique properties. Eventually, we throw them away, or typically we do, and they end up as waste. That waste could be a landfill, and those landfills leach as in things get out slowly, and they end up in the environment. If you have the aqueous film forming foam, of course, they are made to extinguish fires, and a lot of training has happened, including like on Joint Base Cape Cod, where we do some of our work. And they do a training, they set something on fire, they use the foam, the fire is gone, and then it rains and everything is gone from the surface because it starts trickling through the soil. And then again, it finds our way back into the environment. Now, the environment, often we think of as water here, freshwater, aquifers, coastal waters. Um, if it goes through wastewater treatment plants, we get biosolids. And sometimes we, re re we reuse them as fertilizers and fields. So now we have the PFASs in our drinking water, in our coastal waters, and on fields. So now the plants, the fish that grow and that we harvest or catch have the chemicals back in them, so we get them through the food that we eat, the water we drink, the air we inhale. And the, there's no easy way out of this because nat naturally these compounds do not degrade. The fluorine chemistry is so strong that the chemi chemicals are basically stable. That's why we call them forever chemicals. So that's the minor problem. At least you get into micro nanoplastics. These just stay. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that my talk is much better. All right, so I'll give you a little bit of time scale of things. So this is from the Environmental Working Group showing how in 2002, West Virginia was the one, one site we were concerned with. And you see as time went on, more and more sites starting to be of concern. And initially, it was a few manufacturing sites. And then the realization hit that the Department of Defense uses a lot of um, places where they train for fire extinguishing events. So basically, every military base has trained. And that means hundreds of sites were suddenly suspect of being con contaminated. I mean, they basically all are contaminated. Not everywhere is the drinking water a problem. So if we fast forward to now, this is the current best compilation of known sites with PFAS contamination. Um, I'm sure you first looked at Rhode Island, you couldn't see it, because it was just swamped. So let me put a positive spin. Obviously, some states look like they have chickenpox, and that's actually a good sign because that actually they started looking for compounds. Other states, um, I was just in Florida, and they have no problem, obviously. It's because so far they've decided to not investigate, not carefully look whether all of the drinking waters are fine, whether they have other sites. So most of the sites you see in the states that look clean is because there's a military site, and the state, for whatever reason, has not done further investigation. All of this is going to change because presumably this year EPA is going to put forward regulation to regulate how much PFOA and PFOS is safe in drinking water. Mm, the current rumors are it's around four parts per trillion. That sounds like very little, and it is. Um, a part per trillion is about 10 grains of table salt in his Olympic swimming pool. So we're talking really, really, really trace contamination. And of course, you might argue, is it really that bad? Well, why doesn't somebody ask that question? <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> well, actually, it is. 
and I can tell you why. And it is part of the STEEP program that um, my dean talked about earlier. So this is a map of Northern Europe and way in the top left corner you see the Faroe Islands. Um, they are above Scotland, um, west of Scandinavia, and the next thing in line you would see is Iceland. So there's a really tiny community of 70,000 people. Traditionally the Faroese have, have a very marine diet because very little grows there. So they harvest whales, a lot of fish, birds. Um, yeah, that's kind of the traditional diet because as I said, I think they don't even grow potatoes. It's really very rocky, barren rocks. But the other thing they have is they have a very good health system and they have a very high adherence to common sense rules. And one of those is that the kids get all their regular vaccines. And so Philippe Grandjean, who's now at URI, together with his local host, Paul Wai, had this wonderful idea. They wanted to test how well the immune system works in children that are born on these islands. And they're trying to figure out how can we actually measure that because, you know, they're not lab animals. You can't, you know, stuff something in their bottoms and figure out what happens. But so you've got to find a smart way. And the smart way you found is to look at the production of antibodies as a result of a vaccine. So they en enrolled several cohorts, mothers and children. And so by the, um, they knew the blood level at the age of five years in these children. And then they looked at the outcomes at, at year seven. And so what they did is the children come in for their vaccines. And then two weeks later, the children come back and they take a blood sample. And what you would expect now is that the antibody production ramps up. At two weeks is roughly maximum and then it just starts slowly going down until you need a booster. And that's how the whole vaccine idea works. And so now they just looked at what happens to the antibodies in response to the presence of PFAS in the blood of these children. And sorry, this is my one scientific graph and it's a horrible one, but that's what the medical folks do. So what you see here is the concentration of PFOS in the blood of the children at age five. And it's a log scale. So it's low here and it gets much, much, much higher here. And on the y-axis, you see the response, the antibody production in response to the vaccine. And the thick line in the middle, that decreasing line basically shows the more PFOS is there, the less antibodies are produced. <clears throat> and it's this data basically that has convinced the Europeans, the Kingdom of Denmark, I guess the Europeans, and EPA that we need extremely low drinking water guidelines to protect particularly children from a weakened immune system. That's why we're worried about a few parts per trillion because of these results. And of course, now that we've just more or less escaped from COVID, I guess we all appreciate a healthy immune system and vaccines that actually work. But it's not only humans that are affected. So here is a compilation. There's a map of um, different animal samples from across the globe, all the way from fur seals in the Antarctic, all the way down to polar bears from the Arctic. And, sorry, side story. My, my daughter had this wonderful book as a child where the polar bear, the polar fox, and the penguins play together. And I always thought, it's a nice story, but they live on different poles. Anyhow. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. So you see southern hemisphere, you see a few animals, but they're very small bars. The animals are very clean. And that makes sense. There's very little industry in the southern hemisphere, a few people. Typically, it's the cleaner part. The northern hemisphere, you see really high bars, huge bars. And those are linked to polar bears, um, harvest seals and tortoises. So top predators, extremely high level. And that has been known for a while and some of the first studies were actually funded by 3M. I mean, I'm not sure if the story is true, but it's a nice story. So 3M f was aware that there was a problem. They realized their chemistry was in their workers' blood. They realized it was present in the environment surrounding their sites in Minnesota and they also settled with the state of Minnesota for a few hundred million dollars because of this. And then they were trying to find whether, there was, whether this was real or whether they just had an instrument problem with these blood levels. So they started looking for, they got samples from the Red Cross across the US and every sample they looked at, there was PFOS present. So they got a little worried. And then they looked for more samples and they, looked, they found some blood samples from a remote Chinese village 
from the 70s, and half the people had PFOS and the other half didn't. I thought, oh, that's strange. And then I finally found samples from soldiers in the US from the Vietnam War, and they were so old that there was no PFOS. And then they realized they had a real problem because clearly over time they managed to pollute almost every human being on the planet with their chemistry, including the animals. And when they so apparently the CEO gets a report from the scientist, and the scientist says, look, we found your chemical in a polar bear. And they say, well, why is it the polar bear? And the scientist, well, because it was in the seal that the polar bear ate. ate. And so they say, well, why is it in the seal? And the scientist, well, because the seal ate the cod, and it was in the cod. And so they go down the food web. And then eventually they realize that basically their chemistry is everywhere. And that apparently convinced 3M in 2002 to phase out their production of PFOS. It's a nice story. Probably 30 years too late, but nonetheless. All right, so I told you the story already. So bioaccumulation is basically something is dissolved, enriches in plankton, which is eaten by fish, by bigger fish, and then it gets into seals or birds, and then eventually to polar bears, eagles, humans, and so on. So that's kind of the story that we're concerned with. And so one of my students worked with birds, and she compared birds from um, off Massachusetts Bay. They are Starbuck National Bank. It's a marine sanctuary, Narragansett Bay itself, and then um, the Cape Fear. And I didn't, I, I didn't dare to show as many graphs as you, so I feel very jealous now. <laughs> um, it turns out whether the bird lives in Narragansett Bay or offshore Massachusetts Bay doesn't make a difference. There's enough background contamination at this point that birds get it no matter what. The Cape Fear River estuary is very different because it's right next to several production plants. So those birds are sky high in their PFAS loading. The other part we're doing right now, and that's another student of mine, Asta, who's looking at the first steps of how they get into plankton and what happens in plankton. So that's the stuff we're doing right now. The other part we're developing are tools to measure PFAS in different environments, either in the air, as shown on the top, or in the water, as shown on the right. Sometimes we use our local treatment plant, just like, I guess like you do, Fields Point, as a test bed because we know we discharge PFAS so regularly and routinely that there's basically stable supply. We can use it as a nice mesocosm. The other thing we do, and some of you might have seen the handouts, we have a Superfund Research Center here that's called STEEP, and that basically looks at PFAS from various angles. Um, I spoke about childhood risk. That was the study I showed you from Philippe Grandjean. Um, project one is looking at how the PFAS from the military base on Cape Cod has managed to get into the groundwater and how it changed over time. And there's a pro, uh, project in Kingston by Angela said that looks into the different toxicities of new and old PFASs. And unfortunately, the new ones are probably just as bad. She spoke about mine. Um, we have a community engagement part on Cape Cod because that's where lots of contamination has happened. And of course, some of the nice displays is from our research translation core. All right, so let me now swing towards a positive news. Um, I'm not sure where the positive part is yet, but let me go. <laughs> so this is a compilation. It's from the Green Science and Policy Institute that shows how much PFAS has become part of everyday life for all of us. Um, obviously, they have been used in carpets, but if you go to buy a new carpet right now, most Carpets are PFAS free because the manufacturers realize they don't want to be associated with us anymore. Carpet cleaning products often when you have a spray on. That used to be all PFAS based. Um, microwavable popcorn. For a while, there was a loophole that industry exploited was coated with PFAS. Um, I don't think that that's still allowed. Of course, any furniture, you've seen some of the rest. Um, and yes, including cosmetics. The reason I brought this up here is that in all of these cases, we can continue living our life without needing fluorine chemistry in this. The products are gonna be a little different. They might not, might not be quite as powerful, but honestly, I think for the majority of us, it, we will not notice the difference. So this is one of these cases where with a combination of smart legislation and or consumer pressure, we can remove all of these and we will not notice the difference. And there are some bills that actually go that way. But the first one, most, most no, all New England states, um, Rhode Island being the slowest, have started regulating PFASs in drinking water. 
So that's the good news. And then several other states. And you realize there's a link to political leanings, but nonetheless, so some are more protective than others. But Rhode Island has just passed a couple of bills, including one that would actually ban PFAS from being used in food contact materials, which is such an obvious target because you don't necessarily need it, but it is a great way to expose people, right? You have your greasy pizza on something that is meant to, um, so that the oil doesn't drip on your finger straight away and destroys the, the cardboard, but you can use something else, and it's a heck of a lot safer for everybody who's eating the pizza. So this bill has just been passed as of, I think, next year. There's going to be no more PFAS in food contact materials. There's other bills from other states that look into cosmetics, um, carpets, textiles. So we'll see what's happening. And this was one of my colleagues testifying in the state house to argue in favor of legislation. So there's some progress happening. Um, it's slow and it's expensive, but good news is we can, in our daily lives, we can probably get rid of them much easier than plastics. All right, with that, I should probably thank the funding agencies and you for not falling asleep yet. Thank you. So now we have the segment where you ask questions and we, and we do not answer. <laughs> Any questions? I saw this hand up first. Has the effect of recycling kind of diminished this to a certain degree? Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately not. So the question was, has the effect of recycling di di diminished this to a degree? And I mean, I guess to a degree, but a very small degree, uh, you know, the estimate of recycling percentage is less than 10%. Um, and so I think uh, uh, as far as material that is being recycled, um, you know, I think there's hope. I think honestly, though, um, that that's been one of the strategies, honestly, of, of not reducing production is we should put the effort on the sort of the users and on the sort of uh, dealing with the problem at the end of the system. And, and while you know recycling is a nice idea in theory, there's a lot of challenges when you're making all these different types of plastics, et cetera, that we just the recycling can't keep up with the diversity of plastics. So I think the short answer is, unfortunately, it's it's not an effective tool. It, it is working in some ways. I, so I, you know I recycle. You should all keep recycling, but um, we shouldn't be looking to that to be the solution. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Hero? Yeah, um, following up on that question, actually. So given you know, how this PFAS chemical has been used in so many stuff, including many plastic products, I just presume, will recycling then mean we'll just be prolonging the exposure to these chemicals? Because if rather than, I guess, throwing away in a political proper way, we'll be just keep on using it, thereby keep on getting exposed to these chemicals. Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's ironic because particularly in Europe, they're trying to push us with the circular economy. It's this great idea that you just you know, keep moving things around and keep using them. And the realization of this idea of that you reuse everything is that once you have chemicals in there that don't degrade, that loop is really nasty. So that's why there's a lot of effort, particularly in Europe, to get these PFAS out of products because even recycled paper will at this point have PFAS in it because it was often used for some coating. So yes, that is a big problem. It's not only PFAS, there are other chemicals that we have similar challenges. So ideally it would lead to simplification of chemicals we use because otherwise you have no effective and useful recycling. Yeah, and just to add to that story, I mean, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that nature is really good at recycling these chemicals. So even though we may remove them from use, their degradation products or, um, you know, some version of them um, is ending up in the environment and the environment um, is, is processing over time. So for example, the sedimentary layers that we find in our coasts, um, in many cases, organisms are mixing through, you know, essentially hundreds of years of sediment. And so, you know, once, just because we stop something doesn't mean it goes away. It's a similar story with climate change and, and our, our concern about uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so. So yeah, these are 
complicated. I mean, first we need to reduce the use or, or reduce the production, but we still are going to have to deal with some of the ramifications of what we've done for, for a long time. Yes, sir. If a community finds PFAS in their drinking water, how can it be remediated? Can you guys repeat the question? So sure. The question was if a community finds PFAS in their drinking water, what can they do? Well, so if you lived in the state of Rhode Island, the community would have been taken care of thanks to the Department of Health. Um, Rhode Island did extensive testing. They found three communities that were of concern. One was Burrowville, and they got a new, got a land, or they got a new water line from somewhere else, Westerly. And then I think the third one of concern is actually Uri Kingston, but that's a different story. Um, so yeah, what you do typically, you put in big, huge activated carbon filters. I mean, they're, they're gigantic. Um, Barnstable on Cape, on Cape Cod, one of the communities that was made aware of that problem very early on, and they were taking action before that was mandated, spent almost 50 million to put in two huge filters that look like big egg, egg, eggs and egg holders, and basically have two because once the first one is not good anymore, then the second one takes over and you can replace the first one. So you use big, a lot of carbon, filter it all out, and then you carbon is trucked off somewhere else, is burned clean and returned. And so that works, it's just expensive and there's a lot of waste. But yeah, that's the way typically it's done. Are there any um, efforts that you're aware of uh, that have been successful in um, using, you know, finding some way to remove the fluorines uh, so that it is less toxic? Um, or, or essentially, <laughs> is the only way of destroying PFAS to burn them at incredibly high temperatures? Uh, so the question was, is, are there, what ways are there to actually remove the fluorine or destroy the chemicals? Yeah, incineration is probably the easiest, the most established, but it's not the only one. There's, I just spoke to a reporter earlier about this very question. There's any and everything. People try smart enzymes, they try um, UV radiation, they try chemistry, they try uh, plasma, any and everything works. The question is, what, is, what can you really afford? Mm -hmm. And because there's no federal EPA regulation yet, it's, I'm not entirely sure what's going to work out. So right now, we, the only destruction happening is really in incinerators, either on, and accidentally in, in waste, typically waste incinerators, or on purpose in chemical waste incinerators. The DOD was burning some of its legacy piles of the foams till the public cried foul saying it wasn't tested enough. So right now I don't think they're burning either. And it's a really tough one because if you don't burn, what do you do? So we're not in a good position. Um, sort of follow on to that, I'd actually heard something about somebody come up with, an, with a way to break the hard chain, the, the chain of the PFAS much more economically through detergents. I uh, didn't catch a lot of it, but can you clarify on that? Yeah, so there was something in the news that said there was a really low temperature sodium hydroxide and some, some other magic and PFAS would just disappear. And it was a lab study, so that's the first part. Uh, between, you know, a study of something that works in the lab and something that works in the field, there's a lot of steps and a lot of costs. But the part that the story didn't cover was there are two families of PFAS, they, those that have a carboxylic group and those that have a sulfonic group. And we're worried about both. And this, this wonderful study only was able to degrade half of it. And the other half was still present. So, and this, unfortunately, half isn't good enough. So unfortunately, no, there is no, there is no easy, cheap magic powder yet. And probably there will not be for a while because the chemistry is really stable. Um, referring back to the plastic research in area and today, why do we see higher concentrations of plastics in subaqueous samples and samples from the water column versus samples that were taken at mid-beach? Yeah, I think it's just a testimony to the efficiency of the coastal system and sort of removing stuff from it. So we, we've known for fine sediment that estuaries are really great at trapping fine sediment because of, of flocculation um, in particular, also through other um, biological methods. So I think similarly that's happening with, uh, you know, these low density plastics. They're getting caught up in those processes basically and removed pretty efficiently from the system. So 
I mean, that, that's not to say it's, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of samples too. I mean, we, we, you know, there's more work that needs to be done, but, um, but at least, you know, that'd be my suggestion is that estuaries are really effective trapping uh, mechanisms and, and hopefully, just like they, um, honestly, estuaries have been cleaning our, our pollution for years. They cleaned our, our trace metal problems, a lot of our nutrient problems. Um, estuaries have been, unfortunately, um, a dumping ground for, for decades. Um, it does, I think, also, um, it's probably the case for, for plastics as well. Um, and that's why the subaqueous trapping. You have a follow-up? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I, noticed, I know a lot of our sh shellfish come from estuarine environments in Rhode Island. So could that lead to further research on, you know, is the shellfish safe from an estuary versus out in the open water? Great, Great question. question. Um, um, you, you know, know there's, there's a lot of that. active work on, on our seafood products. You know, I, I think um, from what I've seen, I haven't heard I think the health benefits of eating seafood at this point are, are still there. Um, uh, you know, I will highlight that we do have state agencies that are really uh, focused on making sure what we consume is safe. So that goes with seafood as well as uh, food. We get, you know, the plastic problem is not only in the marine environment, it's also on land uh, and so on, as well as other chemicals. So, um, you know, I, I am not here to, I wouldn't advocate stop eating seafood based on what I've said. I think there's a lot of science going on to understand uh, the, the system. And uh, we do have to be mindful of places that maybe are heavily polluted uh, and, and what that might mean today or in the future. Either. How about someone new? Yeah. Go, Go for, for it. it. Okay, thank you. Uh, some of what you said suggests the industry has some sense of their liability resulting from these chemicals being in carpets and, and other uh, products. Um, can you make any generalizations about that enlightened attitude and how that might uh, bring about the reduction? In of the tobacco and the fossil fuel industry. They've known for a long time what the risks are, but they didn't volunteer to, uh, to do anything that uh, rebounds to us in a health way. You're right. Um, <laughs> there's, there's hundreds of lawsuits against DuPont and Camus, and sorry, and 3M. And that was probably a major factor in 3M's decision to leave the field entirely by the end of the next year. And the other part is, and that's of course why they often have been losing in courts, is the internal documents in both companies show that in the 70s already they basically knew their chemicals were in, the, in their work as blood. And a few decades or so later they realized they was in the environment. So, it makes their standing in court always a little weak when these documents show up. Um, but yeah, it seems to have that the cumulative combination of a lot of lawsuits and stricter regulation has at least pushed 3M out. At the same time, the makers of fluoropolymers, in particular Camus and Solvay, have said they're going to increase production to help with the, the polymers needed for um, electric vehicles. So we have both at the same time. The only benefit is 3M was mostly consumer products, so it might herald that indeed we start seeing less people in consumer products, which would be a big, big, big deal. And there's a lot of other products we cannot easily substitute them right now. R&D would certainly help, and down the road you can maybe achieve it, but not right now, not straight away. But in consumer products where you have exposure of us to the highest, really they shouldn't be in. My wife and I have participated in beach cleanups for years, and we've gone through some of the surveys of stuff we picked up. Is that data actually, is that helping you at all? Yeah, well, I mean, it's helping the environment. I think it's um, helping awareness. Um, uh, I think we are learning from that. Uh, there's been, initially, the, you know, the cleanups were being done just for the purpose of, of, you know, getting something clean. I think now we also are getting data to inform, um, you know, about the problem. Um, 
But, you know, you go to some of these places of really high impact and you start realizing how, you know, cleanups are, are really, you know, unimaginable. And, and um, that being said, I also think that maybe they're a possibility um, in terms of uh, if we can be strategic, just like I think um, maybe I'll give the analogy. We, we um, City streets, of course, are cleaned on a regular basis, right? We know we don't want to have trash around. We, there's an effort in, into our infrastructure to maintain our environment um, on land. And I think we may need to be thinking, and there are efforts at some small scales of trash collectors and so on. But, um, but that's where uh, if we are strategic in trying to clean maybe rather than the entire coastline of the world, which is huge, but maybe the places where um, the problem is worst. I think where the plastic is, is emanating from, and uh, if we can get it in those high concentrations and do that regularly, that might be a, a, a different strategy um, than uh, cleaning everywhere all the time, if that makes sense. So I think, yes, it's helpful. Yes, it's important, um, but I also know it's, you know, I don't think we're going to get be able to clean the whole world's coastlines um, indefinitely uh, for the future. Where does all that stuff go? The, the stuff, stuff that we clean or, or the... Yeah, the stuff you all pick up and clean up if we don't recycle it, where does it go? Yeah, it, it goes, goes to, to a landfill. landfill. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, where... Then it goes back into the system, right? I mean... uh, you know, you, yeah, you could argue our waste in general. I mean, I think ultimately our waste management system, uh, I think is we've tried to control it. We line our landfills to avoid leaching. Um, we try and, you know, <laughs> control it in some way. We eventually can... Uh, build on top of it. You can make ski resorts out of old uh, landfills. I mean, I, I don't, you know, it's not an easy solution. Um, I do think um, maybe if we can control it in some way, that will help us uh, manage the problem, and maybe that can be a future mine for the future. But um, yeah, I, I don't have an easy answer to that. It, it's the whole system that we are and what we produce and use, and um, uh, in this country, uh, you know, honestly, we, we do a pretty good job, but we still have a lot of waste loss, as you saw from some of the pictures and, and from your own experiences. Um, it's really tough when you go to other, uh, you know, developing countries where the systems are not in place and, and the problem is just, you know, mind boggling. Um, so, um, yeah, it's tough. It's a tough topic. Um, I don't have an easy answer, um, but but I do think we just need to continue to shine a spotlight on the problem, um, encourage uh, the private sector to sort of evolve. I mean, I think we want to evolve, um, but how is, is uh, not easy. There have been great strides. I didn't feature that. You know, there have been countries that have banned single-use plastics. Obviously, there's been locally towns that have limited certain plastics. You know, we got to derive um, progress out of that, those success stories, and, and start thinking at the bigger picture, what do we do? Okay, one more question. Okay, one more. I saw her hand uh, oh, shoot yeah. up. Uh, sure. On one of your maps where you showed the concentration of these plastics in the sea, I noticed that the Mediterranean had nothing. I mean, was that just because you're concentrating on the Atlantic? or? That was just limited um, data in that map. Um, the Mediterranean has, has a ton of plastics. It's incredible. Uh, I have later, that was an early map, I think, as well. Um, yeah, there's a huge problem of plastics in the Mediterranean, um, and uh, both in surface waters, on the coastline, um, absolutely. Um, so sorry if I misled you. <laughs> well, is the European Union uh, aware of this, and are they? Yeah, they're aware, and I think they're taking some action. I, I'm not familiar with all. There is also discussion. There is work in progress on a global, um, working towards a global treaty. Um, I also want to mention, you know, our our great senators uh, and uh, you know our federal delegation as a whole. I think has really been great advocates for um, trying to make policy both in the United States, um, but also pushing the world to think. Uh, Senator Whitehouse. Uh, and Sandra Whitehouse, who was a graduate of GSO, have been really wonderful proponents of, of thinking about um, how, do we, uh, how do we change um, and, and encouraging pri private sector. So, so, you know, it's champions like that that we need, uh, and, and, you know, we've got to remain positive and, and uh, be hopeful. 
Because if we don't, you know, that doesn't help us. <laughs> Brian GSO, thank you all for coming, and thank you to Drs. Lohman and Dr. Walsh. Um, and we hope to see you.